morning, everyone. How's the sound levels? I don't hear much coming out of it. So this morning, I'd like to speak a little bit uh, and on the uh, the energy and how to work with the energy of emotion. And uh, I'll be using a little bit of uh, material from Trungpa Rinpoche's book, the, the Myth of Freedom and the Way of Meditation. And I don't know if you, most of you out there have uh, read this, but this was a uh, uh, this was one of his uh, early books in the early 70s, and uh, still, I think, one of the best in a lot of ways. <laughs> in fact, a lot of the best materials seem to be done in the 60s and 70s, kind of like rock music, too, right, Mike? <laughs> Some would argue with that. But. So there are... Uh, there are many ways uh, that we can work with, with emotion. Um, this weekend, we have this uh, Zen Dialogue Facilitator training going on, and we're working with it in a, in a particular way uh, through, that, through that method. Uh, but what I'd like to look at today is, uh, is how we work with actually the energetics of the process of emotion. So, we have this unique perspective as as human beings. We we have access to uh, this spacious quality of mind. We call it Buddha mind or whatever whatever term you want to use for it. And yet we still have to wash the dishes and take a shower, keep ourselves clean, uh, go to work. And if we're lay people, we have to figure out a way to make money, which isn't always easy. Uh, and uh, basically live you know pretty much the same life that everyone else around us is living but it doesn't mean that we're relating in the same way to what's happening around us as somebody that doesn't understand that they doesn't come to the understanding in the same way that we do through uh through our practice here so uh in in 1970 i started uh doing yoga from books. There were no teachers or schools around where I grew up in that in that time. Now there's one on every street corner. There's a yoga studio. <laughs> um, there's more yoga teachers and Zen teachers now than there are probably Catholic priests in the country, I would guess. But back then it was just the opposite. And so I was reading from books and the books they talked about meditating. And so I started meditating. And it was interesting. The other day during one of our Wednesday sittings, I, for the first time in many years, went back to the first meditation that I ever did in this lifetime, which was when I was 17 years old. And I remember quite clearly that I, that very first sitting, I had an experience of the expansive, spacious quality of mind. And I went, oh, <laughs> I've been reading all this stuff in these books about it. And all of a sudden, I, I, I had an awakening to that. I actually experienced it. And that changed everything for me at that point. And uh, I'm still doing the same thing today. I was doing the same thing uh, last Wednesday. Or I think it was the Wednesday before last when I, when I tuned into that, what happened so many years ago. Um, still sitting with basically the same owl, just an older body, that's all. However, a lot's changed uh, in terms of my perspective of who I am, what I'm doing on the planet, and in this case, how I work with emotion. So uh, there's a bit of a disconnect, I think, in Zen between the experience of the awakened mind and emotion, which is a, a product of being a human being, essentially. Uh, and they don't, there's not a lot of talk tradi in traditional Zen writing about uh, the power of emotion and how it can derail us or help us, as the case may be. Uh, that's because of the nature of the practice as defined in, in traditional Zen is dealing much more with this, uh, this process of how we awaken to the state of Buddhahood 
um, and in a monastic setting uh, where people were removed from the everyday stuff that we deal with in a certain way. And yet they had emotions. <laughs> I'm sure there was jealousy and anger and all that kind of stuff uh, that arose. In fact, there's evidence of it in some of the stories, but there isn't any talk about how to work with it. So one of the things that that always uh, appealed to me about uh, Trinka Rinpoche's teachings, and you know, being a what I would call a modern Tibetan Buddhist teacher, is that he really got into that. He really got into in what's called the Vajrayana school, um, how they work with these various uh, aspects of being human, which isn't really talked about much in Zen now wasn't really i mean in current times there's there's a lot of uh, psychotherapists and teachers and there's a lot more uh, speaking about this in zen now i think it's actually a wonderful addition to to zen that in modern or modern times we do deal with this but i still go back to what trinkle rinpoche talks about because it's so clear and so uh no matter how much that we experience the undifferentiated spacious quality of mind, it doesn't necessarily mean that we've then worked on that the human part of us that where emotion is arising sometimes in response to uh, times when we're highly triggered or even just in the course of an average day. What do we do as as Zen practitioners? when we feel overcome by emotion, when we feel overcome by sadness or anger or frustration or whatever, whatever the particular feeling or emotion is. And in the, in the Zen dialogue method, we have a particular way of working with it, but I'm not gonna actually talk about that way today because uh, I've done that a lot in the past. This is a little different way of working with it. Um, actually quite different, which is also very effective in certain respects. And that has to do with uh, becoming one with the energy of it, of an emotion. Uh, so uh, all of this, uh, Trinka Rinpoche talks about this uh, in this chapter. I'm not going to read all of it because it's pretty extensive. He talks about how uh, the experience for a, for a, uh, Zen practitioner, any Buddhist practitioner, he's talking about Tibetan Buddhism here specifically, but he's talking about how all of this has to be, uh, 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 we have to become aware of it in the in that spacious context. So in order to get a perspective on emotion, we first, it's kind of fundamental, have to uh, experience uh, and kind of get ourselves established in, or there's a difference between those two, experience of and getting established in is a very different step. <clears throat> it, being established in the spacious quality of mind requires uh, a lot of practice over a period, long period of time. Just experiencing it is still an awakening, but it doesn't mean we're really, it's really become like a part of who we are. And until it becomes a real part of who we are, what I'm talking about here is kind of impossible to do because we just just don't have the energy of clarity enough to see what's to, to, to be mindful enough of what's going on. But as we practice and we do get that kind of clarity, and it you know it takes varying amounts of time for, for different people, then working with emotion can be done in a very different way. So Classically speaking, what we do, what the average human does, including myself you know, in the past, is either suppressing emotion or expressing emotion. Those are kind of the two polarities. So expressing emotion you see every day, you know, um, people flipping each other off, you know, cutting in front of each other in traffic and getting angry at each other. It's, it's like the, no, it's becoming normal in politics to be angry at everything all the time and aggrieved all the time about this and that and the other thing. Um, and uh, it's just an expression of emotion, not, and it's not uh, that I'm saying that's good or bad, but the problem with expressing emotion uh it's it's often fine to express it, but if it's done to excess, then it can get very dangerous. And we see things escalating through emotional encounters with two or more people where something very simple and practical becomes a reason to take out a gun and kill somebody, maybe, or or to get to injure somebody else or whatever. 
So things can escalate with emotion, obviously. So degree is very important. But what we're talking about here in this particular methodology is not kind of ex excessive triggering as much as just the average experience that can be quite disturbing to us at different times, not the getting out of hand road rage type, type emotion. So expression is one way. Um, virtually everyone, I would say, I would say probably everyone, um, uh, at least at some point in their life has suppressed emotion. And there's many, many reasons why we suppress emotion. Uh, probably as many as there are people on the planet, if not many more than that. You probably all know, if you've been practicing for a while, some of the reasons why you may have uh, suppressed emotion. Perhaps when you were a child, you were told it wasn't okay to express it in a, in a healthy way, um, or you just felt through the actions of parents or other authority figures or maybe siblings or even friends that it wasn't cool to act emotional. Um, if you look at the the myths of the the Western, you know, the of the old West, which kind of was very prominent in our culture when I was growing up, the both the cowboys and the Indians were very unemotional. You know, it wasn't cool for an Indian to be emotional. I think that often that was kind of the way they did things as warriors. And then the cowboys were the same way. You know, you didn't see a cowboy usually crying. <laughs> for instance. I'm sure many of them did, but that's not what they showed in the mythical literature and the mythical movies and TV shows and whatever. There was always this taciturn, you know, not unemotional person, and that was the person who got things done on their own, usually, sometimes with the help of a few other sidekicks, but it was the main, mainly one person, usually a man. Um, surprise to all the women here that was <laughs> patriarchal at the time. Um, so, uh, but uh, those of us who, who practice with this, we, we begin to recognize what some of the downside of suppression of emotion is. There's tremendous, tremendous uh, uh, danger in holding emotion in, equal in an internal level to the danger of overexpressing it outwardly, which with others that then activates them and then there becomes the the acceleration of emotion against emotion ego against ego and that is that we create a uh, ill ill internal psychological and physical health when we when we've held things in because it requires a tremendous amount of energy to hold things in and then we become unconscious of the ways in which we're holding it in and it becomes so unconscious that we we just don't even realize it's going on, and we wonder why we're exhausted all the time. Um, and and we're, we'll be in situations that are emotional for some reason or another, and then we come out of it highly exhausted. And usually, that's not because we're healthily expressing it as much as we're holding in and we're not expressing. And it takes quite a bit of energy to put to hold the lid down on the on the boiling pot. You know, the steam wants to naturally just wants to arise and, and come out. So I want to just read from this now, because I thought, I think it's an excellent way that he describes the next stage. <clears throat> this is from the myth of freedom and the, the, the chapter is called the dualistic barrier, which is quite appropriate. We are speaking here of becoming one with the emotions. This is different from and in contrast to the usual approach of suppressing them or acting them out. If we are suppressing our emotions, it is extremely dangerous because we're regarding them as something terrible, shameful. We are regarding them as something terrible. I'm sorry, shameful, I read that twice. Which means that our relationship to our emotions is not really open. Once we try to suppress them, sooner or later, they're going to step out and explode. There's another possibility. If you do not suppress your emotions, then you really allow yourself to come out and be carried away by them. This way of dealing with the emotions also comes from a kind of panic. Your relationship with your emotions has not been properly reconciled. This is another way of escaping from the actual emotion. It's kind of an interesting way to look at it, right? 
I'll read that again. This is another way of escaping from the actual emotion, another kind of release, but it's a false release. It is a confusion of mind and matter, thinking that the physical act of practicing emotions, of putting them into effect, supposedly will cure the emotion, relieve their irritation. But generally, it simply reinforces them. <laughs> And the emotions become more powerful. The relationship between the emotion and mind is not quite clear here. So still lack of clarity. So the intelligent way of working with emotions is to try to relate with their basic substance, the abstract quality of the emotions, so to speak. The basic isness quality of the emotions, the fundamental nature of the emotion is just energy. And if one is able to relate with energy, then the energies have no conflict with you. They become a natural process. So trying to suppress or getting carried away by the emotions become irrele becomes irrelevant once a person is completely able to see their basic characteristic, the emotions as they are, which is essentially shunyata or emptiness or spacious quality. The barrier, the wall between you and your projections, the hysterical and paranoid aspects of your relationship to your projections has been removed well, not exactly removed, but seen through. When there is no panic involved in dealing with the emotions, then you can deal with them completely and properly. Then you are like someone who is completely skilled in his profession, who does not panic, but just does the work completely and thoroughly. <clears throat> Sounds easy, right? <laughs> but is it? Yeah, it is actually. It's, it's quite easy. It's quite simple, but that doesn't mean that it's easy for us to do it. You know, it, it always amazes me when you see someone who's really great at something, who's a real master of anything, anything that we do. It can be painting, it can be motorcycle riding, it can be you know, speaking, it, it, it can be, I don't know, any activity. There are people who have practiced it a lot and you, you watch them do it. I could do that. You know, I was, I, there's this movie about Jackson Pollock. He was, you know, he was this artist that threw paint against the canvas. I, I can do that. I can throw paint against the canvas. But, but actually I couldn't because the way he was not doing it just randomly, it was coming out of his, his many years of working with painting. And, and so it, it, it was not the same as if someone just threw it at the wall. Um, improvising in jazz is not the same as just playing any note randomly although to someone who's untrained in it it might sound like it but it's not it's based on studying scales for many many years and also having the ear to hear what you're playing against and then it functions naturally so there's a naturalness to it, it looks really easy and you try and do it you go oh my god it's so easy so this is easy uh, for someone who's been doing it and practicing it for a long time and who isn't highly activated. Because even people who are well-practiced can be surprised. And this is where we have to be mindful. So all of these kinds of ways of working with things like emotion require mindfulness. Everything requires mindfulness. Um, whether we're a plumber, uh, electrician, a Zen practitioner, no matter what it is, Mindfulness is a necessary component to doing anything well and carefully. We don't want an unmindful, I'm going to be having cataract surgery next month. I don't want an unmindful cataract surgeon. I want him to really be mindful when my eyes are under that knife or laser. Okay. And if he wasn't, he couldn't have done thousands of them. He would have been arrested or something probably, or certainly not still be an eye surgeon. So have to, have to bring that kind of, it's someone's eye. And, and it, interestingly enough, that expression of treat mindfulness like you're, like you're handling your own eyeballs. I, I remember reading that in a Zen text once. Like imagine it's your own eyes. How important are your eyeballs to you? They're really important. Um, and so that is how carefully we have to be mindful of things like this. Why? Because it's destructive otherwise. The destructive energy of ex overexpression 
and the destructive energy of suppression, both in their different ways, have injurious effects and create suffering for ourselves and others. And as practitioners of this path, our object is to is, is not to create suffering. If we can, there are times it's going to happen anyway. Um, and it can't be avoided. And then we that's why we have atonement chants and rituals and other things like that. But for the most part, our object is to alleviate suffering wherever we can. We can't always do it. But in this case, if we're mindful enough, we can. So what is the energy of emotion? There's always energy to every emotion. And let's, let's look at anger, for instance. <clears throat> so anger <clears throat> is often described as being a hot, being like heat. Some people experience it as heat or as red. You know, in, in cartoons, when the, when the bull in the ring, the bullfighters fighting gets angry, they show red, you know, like there's something about red that, that maybe because the Roman god of war was red, Mars. You know. <clears throat> so there's that heat, there's that energy, but it's energy. And that energy starts somewhere, you know, it starts within the body, but it's also happening within this spacious consciousness. Um, and then it, it rises, it seems to arise. And so can we recognize the arising, which is the energetic aspect of it, before it becomes a full-blown anger response? Once it becomes anger, then we need to work with the anger as best we can. And, and that's different. It's a different process. But I'm talking about something that requires more mindfulness so we can start to feel, up. Oh, that's starting to arise. We feel it and we drop. We drop it because it's something we create. We create it. We add to it. There's the energy. The energy arises from some trigger, some ancient trigger within us. And then immediately it becomes something that can quickly get out of control and cause injury to ourselves and others. But if we can catch it, if we can start to feel it arising, then we can, we can drop, we can drop it. We can just feel the energy, <clears throat> not just energy. Energy is just energy. Like he says here, there's actually no value. There's no particular good or bad that can be put on, on energy. It just is. It's part of the life force that's, animates our bodies you know what's the difference between a live body and a dead body there's, there's an energy there's energy to it when it's alive as soon as it dies it's the energy it's not there the body can still be there same body slightly changed but pretty much the same immediately after death but the energy's gone the life force is gone so this is this is part of the life force the arising of the life force that we're working with so anger is just part of the life force in that uh, any of the emotions that arise are just part of part of that life force. Now, it doesn't mean that we don't express a uh, health, healthily express emotion that arises. Uh, there are many instances where there's no reason to suppress that. There's no, there's no reason even particularly to, uh, to, uh, to even let it go, but so much of emotion is destructive and so much of it is coming from this dualistic standpoint, this me versus them standpoint. So uh, so this is this is working with the energy of the situation is <clears throat> is a very powerful way to uh, to release the negative, the negative effects, the physiological negative effects too, because there are many physiological effects to, you know, to excessive, excessive emotion. So maybe we'll just open it up now and see what people feel about this issue. <clears throat> 